Hello, welcome to the AMTC 2022 interview series. For this episode, I have been joined by Peter Curter from Siemens. Hi, Peter. Thank you so much for joining us today. So let's begin with your multiple roles at Siemens, and you have a few. So I believe you're Chief Technology Officer, Chief Strategy Officer, and also have a Corporate VP role. That's right. So you get a very unique and high-level view of one of the most technolo technologically advanced companies in the world. In terms of technological developments, um, broadly and also more specifically with additive manufacturing. Can you just share your perspectives on Siemens' strategy for success? Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you, Rachel, for having me. Um, so, you know, the nice thing about my two roles is that from a strategy perspective, I look at markets, I look at trends and where the world is going to go. I look into the future. On the technology side, I look at new technologies that are going to come and that are going to make that future work. So, from a strategic perspective, what we always look at are mega trends. So trends that are here to stay, right, yes. for the next decades to come. And uh, we know that from an investment perspective, if you invest into fields where you have continuous tailwind, because there's just a need for that, this is a good investment. You just have to stay in long enough. Yeah, it's like investing into the stock market. It's the same conversation. So the five mega trends that we see is, for one is, of course, is climate change. That's an obvious. It's a digitalization and digital transformation. Yeah. It is urbanization. It is demographic change, both in, which, in terms of the number of people on this planet, but also in terms of the age structure that we're going to see. And then lastly, a trend that we've seen becoming more global in terms of globalization has reversed itself over the last decade, I want to say, into localization. That means we're not as global anymore. We tend now to become more localized because of all the disruptions that we have out there in the market. So this is the context when we think about strategy, markets, what's happening. And then we look at technology. And technology, obviously, there's a lot that's happening. Um, we look at AI, we look at edge computing, we look at uh, simulation of digital twins and all of that. But also we look at, of course, additive manufacturing. And we look at these uh, technologies that we think can change the world. Now, taking additive manufacturing and linking them back to the mega trends, if you think about it, um, for one, decarbonization or climate change is a huge, huge topic. If we can use additive manufacturing to reduce logistic costs and the number of times we have to ship products around the world just to create this very one product, this is going to have a huge positive benefit for the planet. If you think about the localization part, we believe that there's a huge talk about resilience right now, yeah. about the resilience of economies and countries, right? And so additive is a key technology in there. Look at the United States, look at France, look at Germany, look at all these places. They all will tell you, we have to become more self-sustaining. And so therefore, we need technologies that help us to manufacture locally. So additive is a great technology yet again. Supply on demand, yes. basically, at, at the point of requirement. Point of requirement, and with that, you become more, more independent of global supply chains, because right now, global supply chain disruption is huge for any company that Absolutely. operates globally. And it is great because it does lower your CO2 footprint. Yeah, absolutely. I really like that. It's the, um, it's, it's the whole, I hear the supply chain argument over and over again, but it's not just big companies like Siemens, it's small companies that can't get hold of the components that they need and they need to fulfill their... Absolutely. Their absolutely. As, as I said, that um, a lot of startups in the meanwhile, exactly. right, we see yeah. that they are grasping of not going the old traditional way of manufacturing. They say, how can I use cutting edge technology to, to create the next generation because with that I can have a competitive advantage. Take a rival from the UK, right? Building, building delivery trucks and they want to have this micro factories uh, around the world, which are very localized by the way. It's not the standard, you know, we have one large plant that is serving the world. They have in the respective markets, they want to build their micro factories and then 3D print the parts to manufacture their delivery vans. Um, for example, iBear. Most of the iBear actually is produced in China. Uh, so all the frames are being produced there. But this is, these are glasses that has been produced by a startup called Umabo, uh, based here in Germany. And what they do is 3D printing. 
3D printing of the frames. And the nice thing about it is it perfectly fits to your anatomy. So, so it really is very nice to wear. It's very comfortable. I have to tell they, you. Um, they see you. They, they look really good. I like thank them a you. lot. <laughs> <laughs> so this mass customization is a great example. So it's not just about resiliency in supply chains. It's also thinking about new business models. And I believe the next generation of companies are going to involve some shape or form the additive manufacturing industry strategy. Absolutely. And one of the key enablers for the localized supply chains is digitalization. And that is obviously a core pillar for Siemens as a company. Can you explain how that supports an Internet of Things approach and then more specifically where additive manufacturing can support these factories today and into the future? Yeah. And thank you for asking the question because uh, at Siemens we really believe that it is the combination of technologies that really create customer value and it is the digital technologies as much as it is the hardware technologies, Absolutely. right? Yeah. And so um, often we are being asked, do you now want to become just a software company? No, absolutely not. It's always the combination of hardware and software. Let me give you a few examples. For example, trains. We have, in the meanwhile, trains is something very hardware-ish. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, we are able now to connect to hardware, by the way, uh, to Thameslink. And, and today I can actually get into my iPad and I could tell you which train is running on time, what is the occupancy, are there any toilets that are not working, and so on. So I really can deep, deep and see and improve operations, right? I only can do this because I'm connected, because I have data, and I have data models, I have connectivity, I have cybersecurity, of course, very important. Yeah, yeah. All of that coming together to enable the hardware, the, the efficient operations of hardware, together with the intelligence that comes from the software. So making hardware smart, if you like. It's no different in, th in 3D manufacturing or additive manufacturing, and here's why. Very often, when we use additive manufacturing, we try to take something that's already there, like those frames, and we say, all right, now let's make them additive. But that's the wrong approach. You really have to rethink about what is it that you want to achieve. Do you want to achieve mass customization or lightweight or whatever, right? Whatever that is. So you have to design for additive manufacturing. Yeah. So we at Siemens, we have built software around that can create um, designs, AI and powered, uh, to really optimize for the 3D manufacturing. So that's the first step. It all starts with the design. You have to design it for 3D manufacturing. Just taking the same designs is not smart. It, you really have to uh, think differently. For example, we created an air duct for a 3D printer, funny enough, and in the beginning, the shape was very linear. But then we had AI look at it, and the shape was very, very weird. It looked like an alien. But, uh, but the nice thing about it is because 3D printing can create all kinds of shapes and forms, it really improved airflow and reduced operation cost by 20%. So it's not just the part, but it really the functional properties and the values yeah. right, that, that it brings. Yeah, yeah. So it is that design capabilities, and then connecting it to the machines, getting those designs transferred on the machine, making the machine, of course, smarter, faster, the post-processing is a big topic we talked about. Uh, so all of that is enabled by digitalization, by data, by, of course, uh, the intelligence that we create over time. I was very interested listening to you in the conference earlier, and you talked about necessity being the mother of invention. And you said that um, additive manufacturing has three mothers, and yes. I thought that was a wonderful way to put it. So tell me a little bit about those three mothers. Yeah, they go a little bit back to the Megatron conversation that we had. So the three mothers clearly are climate change, conflict, and of course COVID-19. Yeah. And uh, what, that, what I tried to say with that is that with climate change, of course, we know that we're depleting the world's resources much faster than we should. So 3D manufacturing can, for one, because of its recyclability, really reduce the amount of, of resources that we need, but also the fact that I can do it right here and there. I don't need logistics and logistics is a major contributor to greenhouse gas really? emissions, right? So do it here, recycle it, that's a great way of doing it. So climate change is really helped by additive manufacturing, or addressed by. The second one was about conflict because of the, the supply chains, disruptions of supply chains, and that we see more and more companies, ourselves included, printing parts on demand. For example, we service our trains that I just mentioned earlier. We print some spare parts on our 3D manufacturing printers in the service depots so that the parts are there by the time the train arrives and is due for service. And the last one was about COVID-19 and, 
And today we've been accustomed to rely on the supply chain from China. And while we still will do that for a long time, COVID-19 really has made that supply you know, intermittent because the supply chains were disrupted, factories had to close down. So many companies now say, what if I could just, like those classes, produce them locally so that I become independent of those supply chain disruptions? And on that note, I think that's probably a really positive way to end our discussion. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much, Rachel.